Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Look at the person next to you and tell them you are a phenomenal human. Tell us, encourage somebody. Look at somebody, just encourage them. I needed to build y'all up a little bit. Uh, Hayden, man, I, he, y'all think I got energy. I feel like Hayden just put it on a whole nother level there. Um, I need him to like wake me up in the morning like, you're amazing. <laughs> just have a great day. Um, hey, if you're new here, like you said, my name is Corey. I'm one of the guys that gets to kind of serve and lead in our multi-church family all over the United States, all over the world. Um, I get to speak and serve and pick up trash, whatever's needed. It's kind of fun. Um, and, and I do want to reiterate something. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's that it's fall kickoff. I don't know if it's that we just launched a chapel service. Vipka just leaned over to me and she was like, man, what do you think about this energy in the room? I think we both had the same mindset. Like, there was, like during that worship time, there was just such a freedom that I haven't felt in here for a while. And it was really, that, like I feel like we've been building to this. Like it's been a really good journey at Central. And I feel like God's got something really special in store for us in the weeks, months, and seasons to come. But I do want to acknowledge one thing Hayden said. Um, Spencer, Nick, but most importantly, you, you young people up here, first off, you're not kids. You're young people. Um, and, and I just want to say this. I just want to look at y'all for a second. You are not the leaders of tomorrow. Y'all are the leaders of today. Um, I genuinely mean that. And the fact that you're up here, and yet, you see, you said you better preach. I appreciate it. But seriously, I'm just looking at you guys. The, the fact that you're up here and it's not, you weren't awkward, you weren't shy, you were giving it your all during worship, that permeated the rest of the room. And there were people raising their hands that never have because y'all were here leading. So thank you guys for doing that. Thank you for being young people leading the way. We believe in a church that doesn't cater to one generation, but that is always looking to batas, uh, pass the baton on to the next. That's how the gospel stays alive. That's how the gospel keeps going, is it's not about us and our preferences. It's about reaching God's people wherever he puts us and continuing to love on and raise up the next generation. If you find yourself in a church where everybody is the same age as you and ain't nobody, that's the dying church. Amen. It don't matter if everybody's in their 70s or everybody's in their 20s. If there's not multiple generations, you are in a dying church. And I am so grateful that Central and all of our churches around the world are full of a plethora of diverse people, not just age-wise, but not just socioeconomic, not just ethnicity, but we are truly get to be a part of a reflection of heaven on earth. We get to answer Jesus' prayer. The prayer that we just prayed together with Hannah is literally coming true in Holland as in heaven right now. And I'm so excited for that this morning. This is me holding back because I feel like I got a lot to say today, um, but yeah, it is our fall series kickoff, and the series title is called Ceasefire, and, and we pray about and we plan these series months and months in, a, in advance, at the same time, staying flexible, ready to pivot if something's going on in culture, but this, this series was, it was titled intentionally. First off, um, I kind of near and dear to my heart, I get to work with our international churches, but we have 11 churches we support in Kiev, Ukraine right now that are literally praying for that word. They're, they're praying for a ceasefire. Like war is real, right? War is awful. War is a travesty. It's atrocious. Like we don't want war. And right now the reality is that in our world, geopolitically, there are nations literally at war praying for that. If we could raise a white flag that there truly could be peace, but it doesn't have to be geopolitical for us to experience warfare. We know right here in the United States, it can feel like we're at war nationally sometimes. Whether you're on the right or the left, Democrat or Republican, if you watch the news, it feels like we hate each other. Can I just give a secret away? We don't. I think most people, if we're honest, we're more in the middle. We, we love each other. We want to take care of each other, right? But that's not entertaining. So they just show us the psychos. Um, <laughs> that's just my opinion, not official church stance. Um, but it can feel like we're at war. We're at odds as a country. And not even as a country, man. Like you can get, you can just get all the way down to like a relational level, right? Some of us, like you came in here, I told you, look at somebody and tell them you look phenomenal because you all do. We come into church and we look good, but how many of you know you can look good and not feel good? You can look good and definitely not be good. Your marriage can look like a fairy tale on Instagram. Meanwhile, it's hell inside the house. Oh, we're just going to be real at Central because I think when we're real about God and his word and we're real about what's going on, that's where God can really work. 
Some of us came in here today and we were at war and we would kill for a ceasefire. What if for the next few weeks, whatever area of life you feel like you're at war in, you just took a few weeks and, and you laid down your own weapons and said, God, I'm going to surrender my ways, my will, and my ways at warfare, whether it's interpersonally with my spouse, whether it's with a, with a sibling, whether it's with a coworker, whether with a parent, whether it's with a teammate, whether it's with a teacher, whether it's at a larger scale. Like even as a church, guys, you know we're at a really pivotal season. If you're new around here, you may not know this. We spent the past couple years renovating our chapel space so that we could deploy a new style of service. Now, let me be abundantly clear, and I can say this, and I'll give you an update. Pastor Craig sends his love. He watched the first service this morning. He is progressing. Please keep him in your prayers. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just pray for our lead pastor. He's awesome. He's on his way back. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he sent me a text this morning, and he was just like, man, that, that was the right word. Um, specifically, I think this one. We launched this chapel service not to appease a certain people group who have a style preference. Can I just, and we also have this service not to appease a certain people group or segment of the population that have a style preference. We do not want either service to become a holy huddle. And all my people said. We want both services to be a tool for the kingdom of God to reach into Holland and southwest Michigan Push back darkness for the name of Jesus to bring hope, life, and salvation to anybody and everybody we can. All we've done is put two guns in the holster in our tool belt. We've got the auditorium in the chapel, right? Come on, enemy. But as soon as it becomes about us and our preferences, we have missed it. We have missed it. And it's so important for us at the outset of this journey of not just being a multi-church family in one church in multiple locations, but one church with two venues on the same property. That's amazing. But you know how quickly the enemy can slide in there. Start causing dissension, which causes division, destruction, all-out warfare. This is how churches can either grow and flourish or split because of stuff like this. I can't believe they have smoke in there. Are they lighting cigarettes? What's going on? It's haze. It doesn't affect your lungs, just so you know. <laughs> I can't believe they still have trumpets and horns and they sing those old hymns. No, no, no. Can we all just like from the outset just be like, no, we're going to raise our white flags. We're going to surrender that junk and we're going to love people no matter the style of music they like, no matter the way they like to dress. We're going to love people. And in loving people, God will bring his blessing of unity and then we will truly become, which is the most important part of this series, and... I, Kim, I'm not even in my scripture yet. I'm just going to, the most important part of the series is that tagline. Blessed are the peacemakers. Us Christianese Bible scholars that brought up in church know where that's from. The book of Matthew, the Beatitudes. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. One of them says blessed are the peacemakers. And the rest of that verse is for they, those that make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. That's a cool promise. I don't know if you know that, but know this, but that's like one of our highest achievements as humanity, to become, to be called children of God. The great theologian Oprah once said, we are all children of God. And she is wrong. The Bible teaches we are not all children of God. We are all children of wrath, <laughs> born children of wrath. But because of God's love, when he reveals himself to us, we place our faith in him, follow him. It says those who obey the will of the Father will be called children of God. That's a different theology right there, right? Furthermore, to be called a child of God is to be a peacemaker. Now notice here when it says peacemaker, we're going to be talking a lot in this series about this concept of peace. How many of us could use a little bit more peace in our lives? Right, Gabby? I could use some more peace. She's like, he said my name. I know them. It's okay. Right. I could use some more peace. We could all use some more peace. The Bible has a lot to say about peace. It says if you've said yes to Jesus and you follow him, you have a peace via the Holy Spirit that surpasses understanding. That means when the world and culture is full of chaos and craziness and everybody else is freaking out, we have a peace, we have access to a peace that literally doesn't make sense. It surpasses understanding. So that means at some point in your life when everybody around you is freaking out, if you got Jesus, they should look at you and go, why are you so calm? And be like, let me tell you. Because my peace is not predicated on my atmosphere, environment, culture, or what's going on around me. My peace is predicated on the fact that I have a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he is still on his throne and he has the victory. So I have the victory in him. So it doesn't matter what's going on around me because I win in the end. You want some of this? 
Peace. So the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about peace. It says we, we, we have the peace that surpasses understanding. It says, I love one of Jesus' names is the Prince of Peace. That's just baller. That's awesome. But he's the Prince of this peace. It says when Jesus left, it said, my peace, Jesus' peace, not the worldly peace, not circumstantial peace. He said, my peace, I leave with you. I give it to you. And so the question today is, have you taken it? Have you received it? Are we walking in it? And then once we recognize that we've been given peace that surpasses understanding, that we have access to Jesus' peace, the Prince of Peace, that we have all of that, then the Bible calls us to be peacemakers. Notice it does not say peacekeepers. And I, th I don't mean to play semantics with you all this morning, but I think there's a difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. Because somebody that keeps something, protects it, and, does, and at all costs are just like, ah, peace, peace. It's like, uh, I think a peacekeeper, like, you know those people, I know it's none of y'all, but they avoid, like, all conflict because they're just afraid of upsetting the peace. So there's that conversation that needs to be had. There's that thing that happened that we need to address. But what do we do as a family? What do we do as a couple? What do we do as a church? We put it under the rug. We hide it. We don't talk about it. And then what happens? That sucker festers and festers and festers until that mold becomes a mountain and you see division. That is not the kind of peace that God calls us to. We're not, to be call, we're not called to be peacekeepers that just ignore and hide and act like everything's okay when it's not. We're called to be peacemakers. That is a verb. That is, that's an action. What does that mean? What does it actually mean to be a peacemaker? It means where there is spaces and places where division and divisiveness, where all out war is happening, we are called to step into those environments and bring peace. That's a, yeah, I mean, I ain't never heard this preach like this before. Like we're, we're called to like be peace abolitionists. Like we are called to like literally like go into play, like to reconcile. Like Hannah was saying earlier, like we're called to be the, our ministry is called the ministry of reconciliation. We are called to be the people that go where there is not peace and help bring it about because we have access to it. So that's what we're going to be talking about these next few weeks is how do we make peace to truly walk as children of God because we could all use some of it, me especially. And so as I prayed about what to talk about today, I had the message. I had it. It was like, yes, this is obvious. If I get a chance to bring it later on in this series, you all would be like, yeah, you should have started with that. Um, but as I prayed about it, I felt like I have this message that I really am 90% sure I should do. And then I have this one that I don't know why, but I can't get it out of my head. Holy Spirit, which one should I do? And I felt like he was like, that one. And I was like, ah, but I'm going to do it because I like to be obedient. And, and, and as I say that, you'll, you'll hear this message and you'll be like, this is a strange one to start out on when it comes to, to peace and ceasefire. You'll see why. So um, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel. Uh, but I, look, I love it. I see people wrestle. It's like they're getting their Bibles. That's cool. Don't, no judgment. There will be a sky Bible in a second. Um, you can read along with us. But we're not there yet. Before I go there, I don't want you to like turn there yet. I didn't tell you the chapter because it, it'll give it away. But, but suffice it to say, to summarize what we're about to look at, is you had an entire nation on, on the brink of war. Actually, two nations, God's people and the enemy. Thousands and thousands and thousands of men to the nines in armor with swords, spears, lances, ready to sacrifice their lives, bleed and die, Literally on the brink of utter war. And, and so you, have, you had God's people, and God's army, the Israelite people. And then you had the enemy army, the Philistines. It was the Valley of Elah. And they're about to lose all peace. The ceasefire is almost over. War is about to ensue. And all of a sudden, the entire nation of Israel... An entire nation. Imagine the entire nation of the United States of America. The entire, every single person saw a problem. And it wasn't a small problem. It was a relatively big problem. As a matter of fact, it was a giant problem. At one moment, an entire nation, everybody in the country had the same, had one giant problem. But one man, one young man, actually a teenager, front row, let's go. One teenager... When everybody else saw a giant problem, one teenager saw a giant opportunity. And what we're going to talk about today is when the world, when our city, when our family, when everybody sees a giant problem and our only result is warfare, how do we see a giant opportunity when everybody else sees a giant problem? 
a giant opportunity for peace. We're going to read a story where God performs what most would call a miracle. How many of us love the God of miracles? How many of us love that we serve a God of miracles? I love that. We sing about that, the God of miracles. But I think often Christians, we fixate on the God of miracles and we forget he's also the God of moments. You know the God that can heal a blind man, the God that can part a red sea, the guy that can bring a dead man to life, that God is also the God of your Tuesday morning at 10.03 at work when you're frustrated with your coworker. The, the God that can heal a withered man's hand, the God that can forgive the woman at the well, the God that raised literally from the grave is also the God at your sports practice on Thursday. He's also the God of your moments tonight on a Sunday night. And what I love about scripture is so many times we fixate on the miracle, but I want to see God's miracles in my life. And so if two plus two equals four, it behooves me to study what two and two is if I want to get four. And so what I want to do today is if an entire nation saw a giant problem and only one young man saw a giant opportunity and therefore God worked a miracle through that, which ultimately brought a ceasefire, a.k.a. peace into the nation. If I want to see peace and I want to see God's peace in my life, and that means I want to see giant opportunities when everybody else sees problems, what was going on in this young man's life that led him to see things differently? Y'all know the story, right? What's the name of the giant problem? Bible nerds. No, I'm just kidding. We all know that. Goliath! Here is Goliath. That's me. That is a proportionate. I asked the team to put together a proportionate picture. Some of you guys are like, I had no idea he was that small. I am like 5'8", 5'9", on a good day. Um, and Goliath was three to four cubits tall, which means nine to 12 feet tall. That's proportionate. That's what I feel like in Holland, all you Dutch tall people. Um, no. I'm just jealous and insecure, guys. It's okay. He laughed way too hard at that. Uh, <laughs> but this is the story of Goliath. And I'll break it down for us. Because if you grew up in church, you know the felt version. But, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you the PG version today. I'm going to give you the real Bible version. And I, and I want to propose one more premise in this passage that I haven't heard preached on much. And that is, I think it's been preached relatively wrong for a long time. I'm not saying I'm right. I've learned this from other people. But even yesterday, any college football fans in the house? Make some noise if your team won. Make some noise if your team won. Okay. Give me a, oh, if your team lost. Yeah, it's, that's why you're in church. It's okay. Pray, repent, pray for the team. Um, I went to school at an SEC school, so I can't help but love college football. That means nothing up here, but you'll see. Um, my man rocking his Texas shirt back there, bro. I love it, though. He's like, I'm coming repping. Took down the evil empire, Alabama. Anyways, um, even yesterday watching college football, I heard commentators go, this is a David and Goliath matchup. Isn't it funny? Like, this is a true story. David and Goliath's a true story. We still talk about it even today in college football. Even today, watching the NFL, you'll hear some, this David and Goliath. And what do they mean? Goliath, the favorite, the big giant that's supposed to win. David, the underdog, little wimpy David, he's going to lose, right? That's what they mean. But I think if you understand this passage that way, you missed it completely. Because as we read this, I want you to see something. David never once thought he was the underdog. Nor did David even act as if he was scared or the underdog. How we approach the battles that God puts, the giants that God puts in front of us may help us be peacekeepers and avoid wars. Some of us today are fighting wars because we won't face the right giants in battles. You know you could avoid a war if you'll fight the right battle? So we want to see the eyes to see that. And so we know the story. You got the Philistines, you got the Israelites, and they're about to fight. Everybody's going to die. It's going to be war. And then all of a sudden, one guy steps out. His name's Goliath. He's huge. And he says, here's the deal. We don't all have to die. If one of you will battle me, will fight me. If you win, we serve you. If we win, you're our slaves. Bet. And the nation of Israel is like, no bet. <laughs> and for 40 days, the giant came out to the Valley of Eli and he made fun of God's people. He shouted down the church in a negative way. He was like, you guys are wusses, you're wimps, you're not nobody for 40 days. And then that picks up in the story. We have, we have David. David's a young man. 
Y'all know the story if you were raised in church. David early on, like preteen, maybe age 11 to 14, had the prophet Samuel come to his house. And he had lots of older brothers. And he was looking for who he was going to anoint as the next king. So he anoints little David as the next king. So imagine you're 12, 13 years old and somebody's like, you're going to be the king of the entire country. And you're like, and then your dad's like, now go watch the sheep. And you're like, what? I thought I was king. Um, So immediately he had an identity crisis, right? Um, So he's out watching sheep, and then war comes, and so they send all his older brothers to the battle lines. Now David's dream is to be a warrior king. So there's war. This is my chance. I'm older now. I've done a good job watching sheep. But no, you must stay and be a shepherd. But now the war is supposed to be happening, and he gets called in by his dad from the field. And his dad says, hey, I need you to go to the front lines. And David's like, yes. This is my chance. My dad knows it. I can throw down in battle. Yeah. And he goes, no, 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 no. I need you to deliver some bread and cheese to your brothers. <sighs> right? <laughs> Talk about a gut punch, shot to the ego. You're like, ah, I'm going to get a fight. No, just a delivery boy. We'll come back to that. And then David gets to the front lines with his Lunchable, with his bread and cheese for his brothers. <laughs> I guess those have ham too, but whatever. With his charcuterie board. Um, and he's like, brothers. What's happening? Because remember, David thought he was going to get to the front lines and see carnage. He thought he was going to get to the front lines and see like Braveheart or Troy or 300 or any of those movies that I saw before I was saved and Central does not endorse. He thought he was going to see, he thought he was, he thought he was going to see that, right? Like everybody's going to be dying. And he gets to the front lines and all the Israelite soldiers are standing there and all the Philistines are standing there. And then he sees this guy come out and make fun of Israel and Israel's God. And and you can see it. You can read it in 1 Samuel chapter 17. David says, what is this? What's happening? And then the guys come over to David and they say, oh, yeah, he's been making fun of us for 40 days. And David's like, what? Who is this that would defy the armies of the living God? And he goes, what's going on? And he goes, well, whoever goes and fights Goliath, if they win... King Saul is going to pay him and make him rich. King Saul is going to let him marry one of his daughters. And King Saul is going to let his family live tax-free. And in the passage, you can read it. David goes, say that again? He doesn't hesitate. He's like, repeat that. Did I hear that correctly? And they're like, yeah. If you beat the giant, you get paid, you get a princess, and your family lives tax-free. And at that point, David was like, bet. He doesn't hesitate. He he goes, let me fight him. Let me do it. So word gets all the way to King Saul, and that's what we'll pick up in 1 Samuel 17, verse 31. It says, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're crazy. He didn't say that. That's my translation. He said, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. In other words, he's been killing people longer than you've been alive, David. But David said to Saul, now, he's in Saul's courtroom, okay? Maybe like this size, bigger, whoever. Everybody's around, all the officials, and they've been trying for a month and 10 days, trying to figure out what they're going to do. And here comes this teenager, 17, 18 years old, maybe 21, 22 years old. It says he's tall, says he's built, you know, but he comes in and he's, he, he looks like a shepherd. And he's like, yo, I can fight this giant. And he's like, no, you can't. And he's like, yes, I can. And so this next sentence is his opening statement in the courtroom of King Saul as to why he is qualified to fight the giant. This next sentence is our clue to why when an entire nation saw a giant problem, David alone saw a giant opportunity. So here's his opening defense as to why it should be him over everybody else. Why should you, David, get to fight this giant? I should be able to. Why, King Saul? Because your servant used to keep sheep for his father. I bet the courtroom sounded a lot like it just did in here. Like a little giggling. I'm sure like somebody leaned over to him like, yo, David, you're going to have to do better than that, man. (laughs) Elaborate. (laughs) He said, "Your, your servant was a shepherd. And it says he entered the courtroom with a staff. He got a big stick. And he's like, look, I used to keep sheep. And they're like, cool, bro. But he elaborates. He says, and when there came a lion or a bear, I took the lamb and took the lamb from the flock. I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. That's a cool nuance. 
the Paul and Paul. In other words, I beat a lion who's faster. I beat a bear who's stronger. They got Pauls. This man is a man. He's got a hand. Let's go. And Saul said to David, do you, boo-boo, go and the Lord be with you. You're going to die, right? But you're the only one we got. But right there, the moments before the quote-unquote miracle, right there I think is the key to how David saw a giant opportunity when everybody else saw a giant problem to ultimately bring about a ceasefire and bring peace to the kingdom, to be a peacemaker. So what does that mean for us? What do we see there? He says, the first reason I see a giant opportunity, the first reason I know I'm qualified to step into this fight, to go up against this opportunity that you see as a problem, the first reason is because I was a shepherd and he still had a staff in his hand. In other words, the first reason is because he was faithful. Somebody say faithful. Faithful. Say it like you mean it. Say faithful. faithful. What he was saying is I had a job to do and I did it well. I was faithful with my staff. I was faithful with my staff. Jesus speaks to this when he says, if you are faithful with a little, I will give you more. But if you're not faithful with a little, do not expect more. So what does the staff represent? The staff represent his given responsibilities, his current title, shepherd. All of us in this room or watching online have a current given responsibility or title. Mom, dad, Son, daughter, brother, sister, husband, wife, co-worker, teammate, CEO, accountant, door holder, coffee pourer, usher, worship leader. We all have a current given responsibility. The question is, are we being faithful with it? And you could tell David was faithful with his staff, with his current responsibility, because When things came his way that were outside of his job description, he stepped up to the plate. How do we know that? He said, when a lion came, now, if I'm a shepherd, 15, 16 years old, and uh, I got a few hundred sheep out in the field all by myself, and a man-eating lion comes up, I don't know if you know this, it wasn't a requirement that shepherds be lion slayers. (laughs) If I'm that guy, I would do what most shepherds at that point did. Sheep, 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 lion, ah! <laughs> right? I'm out. Because that's not in my job description. I may like make some noise, but if that sucker comes at me, he about to be eating lamb chops. I think many of us do that today at, at our works, at our jobs, in our, in our lives. When God is calling us to be faithful, all of a sudden there is a challenge that is outside of the quote unquote job description. And we go, well, that's not in my job description. I ain't got to do that. I ain't got to face that lion. I'm a shepherd boy. I'm not a lion slayer. Yeah, but if God sends you a lion, guess what that makes you today? A lion slayer. And see, many of us have some lions we're facing today. What, what was the lion? A lion was an unforeseen circumstance that had negative consequences on David if handled wrongly. Anybody ever have unforeseen circumstances come into your life? It could be that person that makes that decision. It could be that diagnosis. It can be you get let go. Something out of your control that just hits you. And the question for us today is will you face the lion or keep lying to yourself? Will you face it or just keep lying to yourself saying, oh, just brush it away. It's not really happening. What I love about David, a young man, was faithful with his responsibility. And he faced the lion. And if I was David... And I killed a lion, I would make a t-shirt that says Corey the Lion Slayer and I would wear that the rest of my life. I would look like the rock in that movie where he's got like a lion head on him. I would just walk around all the time. Guess where I got this? Not Ikea. I killed it, right? Um, It'd be a big deal in my life. But then after the lion, he picked back up the staff and he went right back to taking care of his current responsibility. He didn't let it go to his head. And then guess what God sent? What most people would say was an opportunity. It was a challenge. It was a problem. God sent a bear. See, some of us have faced lions today. Some of us have some lions in our lives. Some of us have already done conquered some lions, but we're facing some bears today. There's that cancer diagnosis. A person fully on left. There's the chemical issue that's going on. There's the the habit that you... Some of us are facing a bear today, and, and the question's the same. Will you face the bear or do the bare minimum? 
Many of us are just getting back. See, that made some of us giggle, right? You'll remember it. But many of us are so afraid of facing the bears in our lives and we just keep doing the bare minimum. I don't need to talk. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to address it. We don't need to get through it. And what did David do? He said, I, I faced down that bear too. Now, at that point, if I'm David, I'm like, lion slayer, bear slayer, let's go. But he's just right back to being a shepherd boy. Are we being faithful? Somebody say faithful. But what I love about David is he wasn't just faithful with his staff. He was also faithful with his sling. If the staff represented his current given responsibilities, so the staff would be like his job, his schoolwork, his, his family, like this is what God has already put in your life. What did the sling represent? Now, again, just to educate us, not every shepherd was a slinger. It was not a requirement as a shepherd to learn how to be a slinger. So how did David learn how to do this? The sling represented David's spare time. What did David do in his spare time? He actually became a great slinger and a great singer and a great musician. So here's the question today. If we want to see giant opportunities when everybody else sees giant problems, first we must be faithful. We have to look at every day and go, God, how can I be faithful with what you put in my hands? But then there's also your free time. And here's just a simple question. In our free time, do you have a helpful hobby or a hurtful habit? I, just, I think the miracle of this story had little to do with a rock hitting a giant in the head and had more to do with a teenager being productive with his spare time. Well, let's not even say teenager, human being. Am I going to develop myself and develop a skill or am I going to waste hours watching Netflix? I ain't got nothing against Netflix, but how do we spend our spare time? And I just, and guys, this wasn't like, oh, he, he was like, he made a sling and then he grabbed a rock and he like shot it out there. And he was like, wow, I'm pretty good at that. No, no, no. This was, hey, I'm going to check on the sheep. Okay, now I got to go collect rocks. <laughs> Three, <laughs> you know, like. Pile of 10 or 20, check on the sheep again. Bye, still stink, all right. And then I'm going to pick a target five feet away. Load a rock, fire, miss. Load a rock, fire, miss. Load a rock, fire. Oh, I hit myself in the face. Keep going, Load, fire, right? Miss every time. Check on the sheep. Go collect rocks. Pick another target. Fire, miss. For hours and days and weeks and months and probably years. Until you could give David a rock with his sling and he could pick out a target anywhere and hit it first try. There was discipline in his life. Are we faithful? Somebody say faithful. But the second thing I see in David before he ever got to that battle line is he wasn't just faithful with his staff and his sling, with his responsibilities and his hobbies. He was also flexible. Somebody say flexible. And this is what I mean by flexible. He was flexible with his title. I'm anointed king, shepherd boy, okay. Shepherd boy, lion slayer, yeah, back to shepherd boy, okay. Shepherd boy, bear slayer, yeah, back to shepherd boy, okay. I'm a shepherd boy and a lion slayer and a bear slayer. Bread and cheese, delivery boy. <laughs> like you ever feel like in life you get demoted? You're doing really well and then all of a sudden you get kicked down? What I love about David is he embraced whatever title he needed to embrace in that day. Nothing was beneath him. It wasn't, I don't get paid enough for that. He was there ready to do whatever was willing. I think God blesses a church, blesses families, and blesses us individually when we are willing to be flexible with our titles. Amen? And to make some, sure some of you get out of here in time for NFL Sunday, I will wrap this up. You can see it. You can see all the guys starting to put their jackets on and look at their wives. They're like, it's almost kickoff. So he gets to the battle lines. And this is where I just love to debunk the myth that David was the underdog. Then he took the staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones. By the way, I've heard a lot of sermons given on like the five smooth stones. Anybody ever heard a sermon on the five smooth stones? Oh, only like, okay, like 20, 30 of us. I've heard a lot of preachers, Travis and Bibka, take a lot of liberties with the five smooth stones. I've heard preachers preach a tithing message about the five smooth stones. Like, we, preachers sometimes, we will stretch. Um, but you know why I think he chose five rocks? Because he was going to keep firing. 
It was like loading his clip. He was like, if the first one don't hit, I got four more, right? So I think that just shows you he was going to go down slinging or go down swinging. That's a word for some of you today facing the giant. Keep swinging. That was an exclamation mark. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came to David with the shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. He didn't like him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear. For the battles is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. That is the best trash talk I have ever heard. Does David sound like an underdog? Why do we pitch him like that? Why do, like, he, that's the best. Goliath said, I'm going to kill you. David said, I'm going to kill you and your friends. <laughs> and cut your head off. That's what he said. David, he was so smart. He was so smart. Because then what happens? It says, sorry, a lot of words there. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and, fell on, and he fell on his face to the ground. So this wasn't the VeggieTales version where it was like, ah, yeah, boom, ah, and it knocked him out. No, 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 no. This is real church. We're adults. We're going to tell the Bible like it says it is. David slung a rock and it sank into a man's head. He fell face down. And then the rest of the story is that David went and took out Goliath's own sword, and this wasn't like a Kill Bill movie, like, bing, you know, like this was another movie not endorsed by Central. Um, <laughs> this was like an old big sword, a giant sword, and he took it off, and he saws the giant's head off, and then picks up the head, and it says he walks all the way back to King Saul's courtroom, drops the head, and says, pay me my money. And he doesn't say that, but, <laughs> but it does say he goes all the way to King Saul's courtroom and drops the head. And gives all glory to God. Because you see, David knew something I hope we learned today. That if we are faithful and flexible, God has prepared us to see what he sees. That when everybody else sees problems, we can see opportunities. And then when everybody else sees war, we can see peace. If instead of fighting every war, we will fight the right battles by facing the right giants. See, Goliath came to the battle lines with a sword and a spear, a helmet and a shield and armor. If you have been in the military or around military, what does that make Goliath in military terms? He's infantry. He was designed and trained for close hand-to-hand, -hand, close proximity combat. So when De Goliath came out and said, send somebody to fight me, what did he expect? He expected an infantryman. But what did he get? David comes out. No sword, no spear, no shield, no helmet, no armor, just a stick as far as Goliath can see. And that's why Goliath says, you're going to fight me with a stick? What do you think, I'm a dog? Like, I'm going to crush you. But what does David have that Goliath doesn't know he has? A sling. What is a sling? That is an aerial weapon. In military terms, what does that make David? Artillery. You have artillery versus infantry. Who's going to win? Not even that. Scientists today, Malcolm Gladwell did a great study on this. You can check it out in his book, David versus Goliath. They've actually gone to the Valley of Elah. They've taken those exact stones and they've had slingers use the style sling that David would have used. And they found that the velocity that this rock would leave this sling is the equivalent to a bullet leaving a nine millimeter handgun. Furthermore, medieval slingers, there's depictions of them in stained glass hitting birds mid flight. So these guys were not just like firing a little slingshot, squirrel hunting. These were deadly weapons. And so I'm going to ask you, who was the underdog? The guy with the sword or the guy with the nine mil? You see how 
Because David was faithful with his given responsibilities and he didn't shrink back from the lions and bears and he didn't lie to himself and cover it up and he didn't lie to others and he didn't do the bare minimum but he went at whatever God put in front of him and then he was faithful with his spare time and then he was flexible if I need to deliver things, if I need to clean up things, if I need to take care of sheep or if I need to fight bears, I'll do whatever it takes because he was faithful and flexible. God had prepared him to be fruitful. No, I said that was funny. Yeah, I get, I get excited about it because I think of God is calling us to be peacemakers and there's war all around us and the world sees giant problems. How has God prepared you and I to see giant opportunities? Oh, they don't know. They don't know how God prepared me for this moment. I just imagine if you're David that joker is a lot slower than a lion and a lot bigger target than a bear. Like he from jump was like, I got this. I think the miracle wasn't that a rock got lucky and hit a giant. The miracle was that a young man was faithful with his spare time for years and God prepared him in every moment for the miracle. Here, some of you are like, so what does this mean for me? I think if we want to see peace in our lives, we've got to fight the right battles. We've got to face the right giants to hopefully avoid war. And some of us feel like we're at war, and, and I'll land it here. About three or four years ago, an opportunity to attend this Focus on the Family counseling retreat. And it was about five, six days long, and there were couples and single people, and it was like 12 people, and we we're all getting counseling for two professional counselors. And some of us were there to study it, some of us were there to experience it. It was an incredible experience. And so it wasn't like you'd go away and they do, they did counseling with everybody right in front of you. And so you got to learn as they would counsel you, and then you got to learn as they would counsel other people. And, and from day one, there was this couple there. They were in their, their early, mid-60s, and they had been married for over 30 years, Mitch and Mary. And, and they had raised a daughter who had graduated college, so they found themselves as empty nesters for the last three to five years. And they were at all out war. They showed up to the counseling retreat with all their divorce papers already signed. They just haven't filed them because this was their last ditch effort before they gave up on the marriage. And every time they would talk, it would be like, I don't understand why he doesn't want to spend time with me. He, he's always at the golf course with his friends. I don't understand why she doesn't like me. Every time I come home, it's like she doesn't want, want me there. Man, he always is out drinking with his buddies. Man, I don't drink this much. And it was just this constant back and forth. And watching it, we were all like, yeah, that seems pretty hopeless. And on the third evening, I'll never forget this moment. They were going at it again, and this idea of alcohol came up again, and, and them not spending, and he was like, man, you want to know why I'm always at the golf course? Because it seems like you don't want to be around me. We've never, and she's like, well, it just seems like you're always drinking. And he's like, I don't drink that much. I'll drink a couple beers. And then it kind of calmed down, and the counselor was like, hey, Mary, it doesn't sound like Mitch has a drinking problem. Like he has like one or two beers on the golf course or something like that. It doesn't sound like he's an alcoholic per se. But then she said this, what is it about the alcohol? Why does that keep coming up, Mary? And I watched this 63-year-old woman just kind of shrink down. And then she started to whimper. And she goes, I never told him. I've never told anybody. And the room got real quiet. And she just said, from the ages of 12 to 16, my uncle would get drunk and come in and sexually abuse me at night. And so when he comes home from the golf course and he smells like alcohol, I can't get that out of my head. And I watched this man that had been so prideful and so ready to fight. I just watched him melt and look at his wife. And he just went, Mary, I didn't know. I didn't know. I'll never drink again. And she goes, you can just brush your teeth. <laughs> and they were at war on the brink of losing one another, all because they were fighting the wrong battle. They were facing the wrong giant. The giant was trauma in the past but because they hadn't been honest and brave enough to stop lying and stop covering up, but just be real. Then they could face the right giant, God's way. And because they were faithful and flexible, they would be fruitful. Church family, I don't know what lion, what bear, what giant you're facing today, but God has called us to be peacemakers. We can be peacemakers if we will face them his way, if we will continue to be faithful and flexible. And so we're gonna finish out our times just declaring that. And let me be clear. The miracle belongs to the Lord in the story. 
The miracle belongs to God. The glory belongs to God, not to David. But God uses his people, and I believe he can use each and every one of us. So can we stand to our feet, and I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to sing about how able God really is. Holy Spirit, thank you for a patient people that will listen to your word. But God, I, I am declaring and affirming that I think your word is moving powerfully today. So God, right now I just pray that as we sing this song that you are more than able, that we would internalize that into whatever giants we're facing. God, I pray over these next few weeks as we study your peace and we study how to be peacemakers, that you would help us to identify the right giants, that you would help us see how you have equipped us to fight them. And God, that you would help bring peace in our lives, in our families, in our city, in our country, in our world, because we believe and declare that you truly are more than able. Anything is 
Cause he can do it. Come on. It's easy for him. It's easy for you. or groups or ways to connect, you won't be able to miss it. There's some beautiful, bright blue balloons out there with people, friendly faces who are ready to help you take your next step and find where you want to get plugged in. We love you. We'll see you next time.